give you guys a little extra time. You should have before you right now two amendments. A third is being printed and will uh, be passed out as soon as we get the copies. Um, we are going to start uh, with uh, the amendment from Representative Mishaw offered its, you should have it in front of you, is H1030 ALH 64. Uh, Representative Mishaw, would you like to speak on that or would you like your staff to explain it? I think I can, it's very simple, it's a very simple amendment, Mr. Chairman. What it does, it moves the GAP program uh, findings and recommendations and implementing dates out a year. Uh, further than what is in the uh, uh, special provision now. And my reason for that is that in actually talking with members of the HBCUs and a bunch of other folks, uh, it's come to my attention that uh, here you have a situation where you have an, a, an individual that's been accepted for college, but because they do not reach a certain quartile in there, they have to they have to go to a community college and finish up those two years community college and then uh, come back to the institution. In other words, you say, yes, we have accepted you, but you know, the only way you can get here is to go two years to a community college. Uh, one of the problems with that is, that, and I explain, try to explain this to <laughs> Representative Horn, uh, let's say that you have a student who has a GPA but there are others in upper quartiles that are much higher. They have a GPA that makes them, uh, makes them eligible to be admitted. But you have uh, others in, higher, in a higher quartile than that. That student is eligible to go, but because he's in that lower quartile, then uh, that student is told that he has to, still has to go to a community college. And uh, that, I think, is not fair. It's going to work a hardship, particularly on African American students, and particularly on the HBCUs. And um, I, what I would like to see is, for this matter, since it's going to have that kind of impact on them, I'd like to see the matter put out for another year to make sure that before you start telling these kids they're accepted and that they got to go to a community college, that you know what you're doing before you do that, and you know somehow or other you can work with the kids who are who have that uh, grade point average and we're not to do that with. And so, and so that's why I'm asking you to make sure that it's studied and nobody's making a mistake and that nobody is, is shuffling these kids off anywhere who might, if they end up that way, may end up not going at all. Thank you, Representative Shaw. Further uh, discussion by committee members? Uh, Representative Fraley. I think on this, there has been a lot of discussion and still ongoing discussion between the community college group and uh, UNC, uh, GA, President Spellings, uh, uh, President Fouts. Uh, we are waiting on them to come back with a plan of talking about implementation and timelines. Uh, I think that it would be appropriate to wait for their report rather than pushing this out uh, further at, at this point. Uh, I think if, if they come back and feel like that it needs to be pushed out, then I think we react that way. I uh, also think that they are e extremely focused on the HBCUs of um, working with all of the students. There. So I think we'd be better off uh, leaving the special provisions as they are. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Michelle and I did have extensive conversation about this um, during the break. And as was just mentioned by Representative Fraley, there have been and there are ongoing meetings and work between the community colleges and the and the university system with, in regard to NC GAP. This is not a new program, it's not a new proposal. And I think what's getting lost in the discussion 
are the students themselves. Kids that are, who they and their parents are stretching to be able to afford to go to a university to not just pay, and it's not the tuition, it's <coughs> all the other expenses that it costs to live in the dorms and be involved, and of course you want to be involved, but data is so crystal clear about the opportunity for those kids to actually come away with something for their time, effort, and money. And it's not just their money, it's time, effort, and your money. All of us in this room and across the, across the state. The data is crystal clear as well that when, the, when kids go to a community college, get their two-year community college associate's degree, and, and transfer to the university system, they perform at an even better rate, i.e. graduation rate, they have better outcomes than kids that have been at the, at the uh, university system. So finally, as, as Representative Fraley said, the, we are very uh, sympathetic, in fact is incredibly supportive of, uh, of our HBCUs and recognize the critical role they play in, in their community and in education across the state. We want them to be successful and more successful. S frankly, I'm perturbed with the university system for not having taken this up more strongly earlier and that we have universities that have, uh, let us say, not necessarily competitive graduation rates, not that everything's in graduation rates. Part of it may be how we count people. And these days, people move in, in and out at a gr much greater rate than they did before. It's difficult to even figure out who's a, about the FTEs because they, they transfer from university to university and, or in and out of university, in and out of state. But this is not a new issue. We, we want to see these kids graduate. And if they don't graduate, we want to see them have a certificate or something that's going to ensure their employability. So I appreciate, and I'm willing to work with the universities, all the universities, individually and as a group. But we've been working with them, and discussions during the break I've had as well. I believe we can accomplish this. And, and lastly, I'll, I'll point out that the reality is that this that these, uh, this program begins with uh, calendar or uh, school year 18-19. It it, the implementation is for that 18-19 academic and subsequent academic year. So we've got the time and we continue to delay. We're going to have more kids in more debt with less to show for it. So I ask you to defeat the resolution or the, the amendment. Thank you, Chairman Horn. <coughs> Chairman Blackwell. I want to just take a minute. Uh, I, I agree we should leave the special provision as it is, but I'm going to respond to some of the concerns that Representative Michaud had raised about a disproportionate, perhaps, impact on the historically black colleges and universities. The NC GAP provisions, as passed by the General Assembly, are not prescriptive. There's nowhere that it says drop the bottom five across every campus or take the bottom out of the entire university. The idea was that the university was to come forward with a plan for improving completion by encouraging kids that they could identify as unlikely to be successful at the college based on prior experiences to first go to community college and then if they did well to come back. If this plan ends up having a unfortunate and disproportionate impact on the historically black colleges and university in my judgment it will be a failure of the university administration in the planning process it's something that they can avoid if they will put their minds to it and not simply have a simplistic approach that we're just going to cut everybody across the board and darn we're sorry uh, the legislature is the one that made us do it we haven't prescribed how this would be done we've asked them to bring us a plan 
plan so that it doesn't have the effects that you don't want it to have. Thank you, Chairman Blackwell. Any further comment from committee members? Representative Michelle. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I know I'm on a slip hands or slippery slope, it's already greased anyway. But but let me let me say this to you with, with all due respect. Uh, the, the, the fact that the money money it's not a question of money, it's a question of whether that person is capable or not of attending that institution and gonna say that. Now if you've got a, a person with a high GPA but can't get in because they're in a lower court high, because the other GPA is much higher than his, even though it meets that GPA requirement. You're going to, you're going to say, look, kid, uh, you are eligible to come to this school, but you're going to have to go to a community college first before, so, so that you can improve yourself. Well, I mean, gee whiz, give me a break. Uh, that kid's going to say, well, I'm, my GPA is good enough to get me in, but I can't get there because of what you say, you know, these extrinsic hours, uh, you just can't get there. Uh, that kid is going to be disappointed. I mean, and, and I mean, there, there's so many things that have to be discovered on this. Right now, there are community colleges and universities that are working together. They are doing things right now, but they're doing it on the basis of the fact that, that here these kids are, that they have the desire to do it. They don't quite have the grade point average to do it, but we see something in them to do it. Now, how are you going to distinguish between the two when you come to trying to make a choice here? <clears throat> uh, you've got high school kids going to early college, and that kid goes to early college, his GPA is good, but he's in that lower percentile of, of GPA uh, for the cutoff point, where you've got an artificial cutoff point. And you're going to send that kid to a community college? No. Uh, what I'm, I'm saying is this is the problem that you're going to be faced with. And you ought to have more time to make sure, make absolutely sure, that they don't stop a kid from going to college who has the ability to do it, but it can't get in there because he's in a lower quartile than, than, than any other. I just think it, it, it's, it's just that, that if, you don't, if you don't do it, do it. Good. If they had a plan, they would have done it by now. Really, but they need to take a little bit more time to do something with it. That's all I'm saying. Further discussion by committee members? <clears throat> if not, the amendment we have before us by Representative Mishaw, uh, H1030-ALH64. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. No. The opinion of the chair, the no's have it, and the amendment fails. Uh, next amendment you have up before you should have two additional amendments. I think the third has now been passed out. Uh, it is amendment 1030-AMK-71 uh, from Representative Stam. Uh, Representative Stam, would you like to explain your amendment? Tiny, tiny amendment. Eligibility for special needs, they have to every three years uh, get a certification that they're still special needy. And last year we adopted a way that it could be done outside the school system for a psychologist to certify that. Well, I had a case come, some cases come up this year where they were under the care not of a psychologist but of a psychiatrist. And which is a higher degree of learning. So we're just going to include psychiatrists as someone who can certify this. Uh, any questions or discussion on Representative Stan's amendment? I hear it. Uh, I'm sorry, Representative Lucas. Yeah. The question I have is Representative Stan. I 
Well, in lines seven to nine is if the LEA does it. Last year we added lines 10 to 17 because frankly the LEAs were not really interested in doing this for children who were not even in the public schools. So we had an alternative way where they could hire a psychologist to do it. But a psychiatrist is a higher learning and training than a psychologist, so we thought it'd be good to have the, that alternative as well. And maybe we also could have their lawyer maybe do it. <laughs> Follow up, Representative Lucas. But it still falls under the responsibility of the LEA. No. Representative Stan. No, no, Representative Lucas. It's in section 10 to 17 where it's not the LEA doing it. It's a, a private, this would be a private psychiatrist hired by the family under whose care the child is. Representative Lucas, if I might follow up, I, I believe that under the first item, the local LEA can continue to, to, to do that, but there's a second option which allows a psychologist or psychiat psychiatrist with Representative Stam's change to actually do this separate from the LEA. Follow up. This child who has a special needs is an indigent child and you expect the family to pay for the psychic, psychological or the psychiatric uh, evaluation for women with a disability. Well, Representative child, Stan? Yes, uh, the child is not necessarily indigent. Uh, there's no requirement of indigency in this case. And secondly, if the, if the child is indigent, uh, they may get the funds, I guess, through Medicaid or whatever else, you know, pays for that kind of thing. But it's not an indigent situation. Not every not everybody who needs a psychiatrist is also poor. Representative Michelle. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'm uh, a technicality, I think, here. Yeah. I'm looking at this. It says between inserting between lines 39 and 40 and you got to start out with uh, line 4 subsection C and subsection C is, begins on 22. What, 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 what? Actually, just a whole second. I just forgot to stamp. Actually, we've got to go all the way back here to 26. There's B. And it's everything else. Everything else is under B. So all the way over to here. And could I supplement my answer to Representative Lucas? Representative Sam. Uh, Representative Lucas, if the person was indigent, uh, the uh, parent of that child could always go back to the LEA on line seven to nine. They can, but they don't have to. Because they may the kid may have been under the care of a psychiatrist for years. So why go you know, why go hire somebody else or do a review by somebody else? You know, the kid still has the same problem he or she had last year. And that is presently the way it is, Representative Lucas, and his addition of a psychiatrist isn't changing that, that element. Uh, staff, do we have any further needed clarity or we think we're okay? Leslie. Uh, the confusion there was that that's actually a change to the existing statutory language, so that's just the way the original um, provision the changes and amendments to that statute had stopped after subsection B1, but we just added in subsection C so we could make the statutory change that Representative Stam requested. Any further comment from committee members? If not, we have Representative Stam's Amendment H 1030-AMK-71, version one before us. All those in favor of Representative Stam's amendment, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? No. Uh, in the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Moves us to our third and uh, amazingly final amendment of the day. 
Also, from Representative Stam, uh, you should be, uh, Representative Shaw, we should be looking for H1030 AMK 72, version 3. Well, I'm studying on school start times. Yeah, the uh, yes. line 3 is a study on school start times. Uh, Representative Stam, would you like to explain the amendment? Uh, I would first by a contest and then a story. Uh, the content, everybody knows the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, but I'll give a quarter to the first person who can quote the Third Amendment. Uh, no takers. Uh, my son, <laughs> in the, uh, <laughs> a quarter is all I have. My, when my son graduated from high school, he got the yearbook award for the Rip Van Winkle Award. And I said, Nathan, how'd you get that? And it turned out he slept through first period the entire year. And he said, I wasn't really asleep. I just had my eyes closed. And the experts tell us that secondary school students just need to start later. But we don't have any data on that. There are several states experiment with this. But this is just to ask the uh, State Board of Education just to find out where, when our schools actually start in North Carolina. We're not actually asking them to uh, do anything about it, just to get the data, so that then the people who are already researching it at UNC, at UNC can then uh, study the data to see if they can figure out if that really would be a educational benefit. You know, we like to have the <coughs> high school students get picked up by the bus at 6 a.m. and then send the bus back to pick up the little ones at 8 a.m. But the educational reality is that the little ones are up at 6 and the high schoolers aren't awake then. And they just never do wake up <laughs> until later in the day. And it's not a matter of not getting enough sleep. Even, even if they go to bed early, they still don't wake up. Uh, Representative Stan, there's one, uh, I'm going to add a, a, a staff technical change uh, at the end of our amendment there. And if no one objects, we'll just have this staff do this. And Representative Stan initial it should say to this of the study uh, to the joint legislative to the joint legislative oversight committee on education. So in line Thanks. seven, at the end, we'll add in oversight and without objection, uh, uh, we'll have Representative Stan sign that amendment. Further discussion of Representative Stan's amendment. Uh, Representative Lewis. Well, I'm not beating up on your Mr. Stan, and I don't mind to tell you I'd love to have this. But given the cutbacks that we've had and, and the resources available of the system of education, we're confident that we're going to have uh, enough staff to get this accomplished. Uh, I'm to a Bill, Bill Covey's my political mentor and buddy, so he will do it himself. If need be, it would require one email going out to 115 and then maybe tabulating the results might take a few more than that. But I don't think it's uh, overburdened. I mean, it'll, it'll cost a little bit of money, but not not much. No. Further discussion? Uh, without any further discussion, you have Representative, Zan Representative Stam's uh, Amendment 10, uh, H1030-AMK-72, Version 3. Before us, all those in favor of this amendment, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Uh, <clears throat> the amendment uh, is adopted. Uh, you guys have done a wonderful job. We have uh, <clears throat> two amendments. Uh, with no further uh, business of the committee, if someone would like to move that the House Appropriations Committee on Education adopt the Appropriations Committee report as amended and further move the staff be authorized to make technical corre corrections and conforming changes related to reconciling the various amendments adopted and that the appropriate totals may be adjusted accordingly. Uh, Representative Whitmire has so moved, seconded by <coughs> Chairman Horn. Uh, all those, any for discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. 
Uh, the opinion chair, the ayes have it, and the uh, committee report is adopted. And we are, you are adjourned. Thank you, committee members, for your hard work.